following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So those of us who have been around esoteric studies for a while will be familiar with the story. But I'll recap for those who might be new. Around the middle of the 20th century, a conflux of events the world over worked to tear down the veil of secrecy that was surrounding many of the world's great religions. And truths that had been hidden from the masses for thousands of years were finally brought into the light. In the evening of 1946, a pair of shepherds in Qumran found a series of scrolls sealed in clay pots hidden in caves, scriptures that had been hidden away for almost 2,000 years, the discovery of which would shake the traditional understanding of Christianity to its core. In October of 1950, the Chinese marched on Tibet, which precipitated the exposure of many formerly secret aspects of Tibetan Buddhism to the public in China's attempts to defile the sanctity of their conquered nation's sacred rites and teachings. Meanwhile, during the first half of the 20th century, many Buddhist teachers were moving west and were beginning to teach the practice of meditation to the masses, a practice which many people who grew up in Buddhist cultures can tell you was typically reserved for monks and nuns. And in 1950, a relatively unknown man writing under the name On Veor published a book called The Perfect Matrimony, which dared to reveal to the masses a truth about religion, sexuality, and the meaning of life itself that had been kept in confidence by secret societies since before the dawn of recorded history. All of this was paving the way for what astrologers call the Age of Aquarius, an era in which many of the old boundaries and hierarchies would be torn down, and many things that were formerly in darkness would be brought into the light. But that's all preliminary. Here in a Gnostic school, most of us knew this story already. What many of us may not know is that this story has actually been told before. For instance, Jesus also revealed things that were previously hidden to the masses. He said to his disciples, For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. More recently, you might have heard of an organization called the Theosophical Society. This was founded by a woman named Helen Blavatsky, who was an initiate herself. And the Theosophical Society was engaged in the practice of taking many esoteric teachings, or previously esoteric teachings, primarily from Tibet, and revealing them to the public in, in, in the Western world. Now, this organization is mentioned in the works of Samuel and Vior. And I thought it might be helpful because we in the Gnostic movement are also involved in, in the, the practice of taking teachings that were previously esoteric and sharing them with the public and, and hoping to uh, help the spiritual development and the evolution of mankind through the revelation of these teachings. To look at how the Theosophical Society uh, fared when they did this same practice with uh, some other teachings and see if we can learn a bit from their experience. 
And so Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society, she wrote this in one of her articles uh, about the results of, um, of sharing these teachings. She said, the results have been far from encouraging so far. The candidates in question, though plainly warned against it in advance, began wrong by selfishly looking to the future and losing sight of the past. They forgot that they had done nothing to deserve the rare honor of selection. Nothing which warranted their expecting such a privilege. That they could boast of none of the above enumerated merits, which we will talk about later. Yet, each and all had vanity enough to suppose that their case would be made an exception to the law of countless centuries establishment. As though, indeed, in their person had been born to the world a new avatar. All expected to have hidden things taught. Extraordinary powers given to them because, well, because they had joined the Theosophical Society. Some had sincerely resolved to amend their lives and give up their evil courses. We must do them this justice at all events. And so there are some things to remember about why these teachings were hidden. First of all, these teachings were being guarded by masters of compassion. These people care about you and me. And they didn't do this because they wanted to keep people ignorant. They kept these teachings secret out of a love for the Dharma and out of a love for mankind. And they imposed onerous requirements on, on gaining access to these teachings because they didn't want people to get hurt. Nowadays, pretty much anyone can access the teachings. And this is necessary and good. The solution is not to go back to keeping these teachings secret. In fact, in the major mysteries, Samuel and Vior talks about how it's the tenebrous ones, the demons, who want to say that humanity is not prepared for these teachings and, and to, to close them off and keep them secret. He said the tenebrous ones state that sexual magic must not be taught to humanity, alleging that humanity is not yet prepared for it. Thus, in this way, they close the doors of Eden to this wretched, suffering humanity. This is how the tenebrous ones close the doors of Eden to the souls who long for the light. Then, after having stated to the naive aspirants that sexual magic is dangerous, that the, the tenebrous ones enclose them within their complicated breathing systems. So this is how they close the doors of Eden to the suffering ones, and thereafter they enslave them within their intellectual systems. The tenebrous ones strive at any cost, no matter what, to avoid the sexual problem because the tenebrous ones hate the doors of sex. However, even though these teachings are, are, now, are now open, it's important to remember that people are no longer approaching them with the preparation that was acquired in previous ages. And as Blavatsky pointed out, Many of the, the members of the Theosophical Society had sincerely resolved to, to amend their lives. They, they were being better people. But even this surface level type of, of, of revolution is, is, is not enough. And the consequence of, of this lack of preparation is, is clear. What we're witnessing in, 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 in a lot of people who... who start in these studies is a, a psychological imbalance and, and the use of these teachings to, to fortify lust and fanaticism and pride. And Samuel and Vior talked about this in the Gnostic movement too. He said an, infinite, an infamous harvest of Hasnamusin is going to appear, mainly in the South American territories of Venezuela and Colombia. And this is simply because all of those little brethren have not dedicated themselves to the disintegration of the ego. They are very lazy, meaning that they are lazy in that sense because they only want initiations, degrees, powers, etc. And they do not worry about the disintegration of their ego. Therefore, the future that awaits those two countries is indeed an infamous harvest of Hasnamusin with double centers of gravity. This is what will occur unless all of them dedicate themselves in a massive manner to the disintegration of their ego. 
So even though the requirements of old are no longer imposed upon us in the Aquarian age, I thought it might be useful to examine some of the old expectations of those who sought access to the mysteries, to see what their teachers felt was important as preparation for the study and practice of esotericism. Now, we're going to look at this list today, but I don't want you to get discouraged. When you see these things, you say, oh my gosh, I don't have any of these characteristics. Don't just withdraw from these studies. Remember, if you are here, you should be here. Your being, your inner God wanted you to have access to these teachings. I'm showing these to you today because I merely want you to be cognizant of characteristics that we might be lacking so that we know areas that we, we need to work on. Now, the set of requirements that we're going to look at today is from book four of the, the books of Kuite, which are Tibetan Buddhist tantras, and a chapter called The Law, the law of the, Yupa, the, the Yupasans. And Yupasans come from, comes from the word Yupasana, which means those who sit near. So these are the requirements of those who sought to, to sit near to the deity or the master and to learn from them. Now, the original text is hidden, but we have uh, a version that was brought to us by Blavatsky who had access to, the, to these, uh, these scriptures. And so the first, the first requirement of those seeking to access the teachings was perfect physical health. Hmm. Now, that might seem odd to those of us in, in the Western mindset because... Due to, due to the development of, of religion in the West, we have developed this, uh, this mental habit of thinking that spiritual matters only take place in the mind. And we say things like, what you believe makes all the difference. And, oh, if you, if you believe X, Y, and Z, then, then you can magically nullify the law of cause and effect and, 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 and all your sins will be forgiven and, and you'll, go, you'll go straight up to heaven with, with, with don't pass, go, don't collect $200. And this can lead to the, to the belief that there can be uh, many truths and many paths and that spirituality is just imaginary. However, it's important to observe a, a, a characteristic about who can achieve self-realization. Who can walk this path? And notice that of all the organisms on earth, only humans can achieve self-realization. Now what makes humans different from the other organisms on the planet? It's not our consciousness. Animals and, and plants all have consciousness. They've done studies recently that have shown that, that, that plants can, can communicate with each other. They can respond to stimuli like, like, like bugs eating them or, or gardeners coming with the clippers. And they've shown that animals have, have intelligence. Back a few years ago, they were, um, they were playing the World Cup and there was this, this hubbub in the news about this, this squid that could predict the outcome of World Cup games. I can't predict the outcome of World Cup games. This squid was smarter than me. This squid had more psychic abilities than I have. Yet the squid cannot achieve self-realization. They've done a lot of studies that show that animals can communicate with language that has intellectual content. I remember one study I was reading was talking about prairie dogs. And they were examining... Uh, the chirps that prairie dogs make as different people walk by. And they varied the characteristics of the people who walked by, and they observed the, the variation in the chirps that the prairie dogs made communicating to each other. And they noticed that the chirps varied based on the, uh, based on the characteristics. So that not only do the prairie dogs have a chirp for saying that, the, oh, this is a man who's walking by, or a woman, but they had a, chirp, a, a, a series of chirps that saying, watch out, there is, there's a man with a beard and a plaid shirt and blue jeans walking by the hole. Keep your eye on him. And so they were, they, they were able to discern, examining these, these, the, the prairie dog language, that the prairie dogs were actually communicating in, in, in 
intelligent things to each other. And they've, they've done this with dolphins too. So they, 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 they haven't deciphered the language of dolphins. Just like they haven't fully deciphered the language of prairie dogs, but they've able to, to analyze dolphin language the same way they can analyze human language and, and using statistical methods in order to uh, extract the presence of intelligent, uh, intelligent content. They can do the same thing with dolphin language and find that the dolphins have intelligence too. So it can't be... It can't be in the mind or the, or the consciousness that makes, that, that makes us able to achieve self-realization. What is it? It's our physical bodies. Only humans have human physical bodies. And so this spiritual work cannot be abstracted from our physical bodies. So what do we do with this information? Well, first, take care of your body. Don't eat poison. Look be cognizant of what you eat. We have a, a series of lectures on, on, on Gnostic Radio called uh, Caring for Your Temple or Healthy Spirituality that talks about the uh, different factors to look for in, the, uh, in, in what you eat and, and how you take care of your body. So I encourage you to listen to those lectures and heed them. Also, don't recklessly endanger yourself. Don't, don't uh, uh, go skydiving or step in front of the bus or things that could harm your physical body. I remember a story where uh, Samuel and Vior was, um, was, was with a man and the man was about to step out in front of a car and uh, Samuel was just stop. He said, these people who are driving the cars, they're all asleep. Look both ways before you cross the road because your physical body is very important. But if, even if you don't Meet this, meet this characteristic, even if you don't have perfect physical health. If you're old or you're injured, not all is lost. Look what some Ellen Vior said in the Aquarian message. If you're already an elderly woman, if you can no longer have sexual contact, if you are already an old man, if you are sick, if you comprehend that your physical vehicle is no longer worthy in order to work with the Arcanum AZF, then you must train yourself for astral travel. That is to say, you must learn to consciously travel in the astral body. So, my child, prepare yourself with concentration, meditation, and adoration. Be chaste in thought, word, and deed. Comprehend your errors. Annihilate not only desire, but even the very shadow of desire. Thus, my child, Prepare yourself with creative comprehension and postpone your work with the Arcanum AZF for your future reincarnation. Are you an old man? Are you an old woman? Are you an invalid? Then do not be disappointed, beloved child. Do not fill yourself with affliction because in your future reincarnation you can work with the Arcanum AZF and you will convert yourselves into gods. And so I encourage you, if you find that your physical vehicle might not be in the best of shape, heed Samuel and Vior's advice. And I guarantee you, if you do all the things that he talks about in this passage, then you will be far better prepared for the, for the path of initiation than most of the people who have uh, uh, really healthy physical bodies today. The next characteristic, number two, is absolute Mental and physical purity. Well, I think we can skip this one because I'm sure all of us here have mastered it already. Now, yeah. Volumes can be said about this. Now, this doesn't mean having completely eliminated the ego. Remember, this was the law for, for chelas, for, for, for people who were just starting on the path. And so, none of them had completely eliminated the ego. But this is primarily about chastity. Stop hemorrhaging the sexual energy through the body and the mind. Through, through fornication and adultery and pornography and masturbation and sexual romantic fantasies and a thousand and one other ways that society has come up with for, for us to waste and abuse the sexual energy. Now, this relates back to the first requirement about physical health. We already 
elaborated that the body was important. Now the body is an engine for the transformation of energy. So why would we need that engine to be healthy? Physical health is important because the transformation of that energy is important to the spiritual work. Now, it would be silly to say, we really need this engine to be transforming, uh, transforming energy properly, but we don't need the energy that it transforms. That would be ridiculous. So the spiritual work not only requires the, 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 the engine, but it also requires the energy produced by the engine. And we can lose that energy through all of the three brains, not just the sexual brain. For example, Samuel M. Dior talks about the, the intellectual center. He says in The Major Mysteries, our disciples must carefully avoid reading too many newspapers. At a banquet for journalists of an independent press in New York, a journalist clearly and forthrightly stated the following, we, the journalists, are intellectual prostitutes. Therefore, it is not convenient to read too many newspapers unless we want to prostitute our minds. Now, I hunted down this quote because I felt that the, the full quote was worth reading so that we can have some cognizance of the nature of the media that we are consuming. Now, as a bit of a background, this was given at a banquet for, um, the, for, for the press in New York. And someone had stood up and had made a toast to a free and independent press. And John Swinton, who was a journalist at that time, he stood up and he responded to, the, he responded to that toast with the following. There is no such thing at this date of the world's history in America as an independent press. You know it, and I know it. There is not one of you who dares to write your honest opinions, and if you did, you know beforehand that it would never appear in print. I am paid weekly for keeping my honest opinion out of the paper I am connected with. Others of you are paid similar salaries for similar things. And any of you who would be so foolish as to write honest opinions would be out on the streets looking for another job. If I allowed my honest opinions to appear in one issue of my paper, before 24 hours, my occupation would be gone. The business of the journalist is to destroy the truth, to lie outright, to pervert, to vilify, to fawn at the feet of mammon and to sell his country and his race for his daily bread. You know it, and I know it. And what folly is this toasting to an independent press? We are the tools and vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks. They pull the strings, and we dance. Our talents, our possibilities, and our lives are the property of other men. We are intellectual prostitutes. Now, this was said in 1890 about newspapers, because that was the only real form of media that existed in that time. But if you observe, you can see that it applies to all media today. Take a look at the types of media that you consume and see what it does to your mind. Observe that the media today is, is made for us to to prostitute ourselves in all sorts of ways, like, like lust. For instance, have you ever seen scientists on TV? Now, I know a lot of scientists in real life. And what I've noticed is that most of those scientists tend to look like me. I saw a graph once that showed the people who are better in math tend to be less physically attractive. I'm really good at math. Yet, for some reason, scientists on TV all seem to look like supermodels. Have you ever noticed this? That's because the TV producers are feeding on your lust. If scientists on TV looked like me, no one would watch the show. And they feed on anger. They say, look at this injustice committed by evildoers. And they tell you about things that were done by other people to, peop to, to people that you don't even know. And you're like, oh my God. These evildoers, we, 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 we have to do terrible things to them. You, 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 you fantasize about, about uh, uh, the, the swift hand of justice coming and, and hammering their faces. And, and, 
and all sorts, of, all sorts of terrible things, and you get angry, and you lose all sorts of energy through the mind. And, and, and people like feeling anger. If they didn't like feeling anger, why, would they, why do they keep watching all of these shows and reading all these articles that, that they know are going to make them feel angry? They make, you, they, they, they make us feel vanity and, 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 and pride. Pride in our nation, pride in our religion. And they try to make us feel, feel shame or inadequacy, inadequacy about ourselves so we can buy their products. Or enviousness or covetousness. Look at all the TV shows and, and magazines that are exclusively dedicated to, to fawning over the petty details over the lives of rich people. Why? Why is that interesting to anyone? Why do we care what sort of sandwich this person likes to eat? I don't even care what sort of sandwich I like to eat. But when we consume these things, we allow, this, we, we allow these impressions into our mind, and we are lending our minds to the purveyors of this media to do with us what we will. So that we become the jumping jacks, and, 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 and they're pulling our strings. And they manipulate us into mental and social behaviors that are beneficial to them. And so, it behooves us, it behooves us to, to investigate what really is this, this mental purity that we should be cultivating. Samuel and Vior says, we need to have a simple and pure mind, like the mind of an infant. Only in this way can we enter into the major mysteries. We need to liberate our intelligence from all types of sects, religions, schools, political parties, concepts of country and flags, theories, etc. All these things are the abominations and filthiness of the great whore, the intellectual animal mind, whose number is 666. Six, six. So we want to have a mind like an infant. Even Jesus said, I give praises to you, Father, Lord, and he Lord of heaven and earth. For you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them unto the childlike. So think with the mind of an infant. With pure, pristine consciousness. Just observing the world as it is without words or labels, or concepts. I remember a scientist on TV that I was watching, speaking of scientists on TV, um, and he was talking about how he didn't think that, um, that, people could, that people could think without words. He thought that, that words and language were so inextricably linked to our thoughts that it was impossible to have thoughts without language. But in Zen, they teach you how to think without labels, how to see things just as they are. Just the sound of the car driving by. The feeling of the floor on your feet. The taste of the water as it goes into your mouth. Without labels or, 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 or ideas about any of these things. And an infant has a mind before language and labels and, 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 and biases and concepts. And so cultivate that. Cultivate a mind free of duality. And we move on to number three. Unselfishness of purpose. Universal charity and pity for all animate beings. Bodhicitta. I think as, as an example of, of, of this with regards to the path of initiation, this, this principle, um, I like what Samuel Alam Dior says about Jesus, and I'm going to share that with you. He said, the Bodhisattva Jesus did not covet initiations, powers, titles, degrees, hierarchies, masteries, social or divine positions, kingdoms, gold or silver. Being higher than all angels, archangels, seraphim, powers, etc., he preferred only to be a good man. Therefore, instead of coveting degrees and powers and initiations and divine lordships, 
We must exert the effort of becoming useful beings to this suffering humanity. We must exert great efforts in the law of the great service. We must seek the fertile work in the great work of the Father. We must seek the means to become more and more useful to this wretched, suffering humanity. This is better than coveting internal titles and initiations and esoteric degrees and planetary kingdoms. These teachings were given to us to help us forsake our self-will, our sense of self, our desires, and to make us useful instruments for the soothing of the suffering of others. This path is not about becoming more. It's about becoming less. And so our orientation before we enter into these studies needs to be a desire to serve others. Now many people have this fantasy about being enlightened. And that we're, we're still going to have this, the, our, our personality and our, and our animal mind. But, but after we're enlightened, we're going to have powers and respect. And people will say, oh, you're Master Muckety Muck. Oh, bow down and worship you. But this is a fantasy of being a, about being a Hasnaboos. Or worse, a black magician. Listen to the words of Jesus on this matter. Another parable he put forth unto them saying, the kingdom of God is like to a grain of a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field which indeed is the least of all seeds but when it is grown it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So there's two observations I want to point out about this parable. It's a parable about, by Jesus so obviously it's very deep but there's Two things I want to focus on. First of all, is the seed. Now, an observation to make about seeds is that you plant a seed in the ground and then a, a, a plant grows up. But once the plant grows, the seed is gone. There's no seed anymore. Once the mustard seed is planted and the mustard tree, the mustard tree grows, the, the, mustard, the mustard seed isn't there. We are the seed. Our personality, our sense of self, and our, 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 our animal mind, that's the seed. And the purpose of this path is to get rid of those things. So if we're clinging to the seed, if we're clinging to the, to, to, to the sense of self that we have, the tree, the full tree, is never going to appear. The second observation I want to make in that in describing the tree, the key characteristic of the tree that Jesus focuses on is how the tree is able to serve the birds. Like we were, like we were just discussing, the purpose of this path is, 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 is not to give you a new and, and, and different sense of self or your pride is, is, is fortified even, even greater than it already is. The purpose of this path, the purpose of the tree, is to serve the birds. So that the birds of the air can, can come and lodge in the branches thereof. So that we, in walking this path, in using these teachings, can serve others and help to soothe their suffering and help them to walk the path too. Number four. Truthfulness and unswerving faith in the law of karma, independent of any power in nature that could interfere, a law whose course is not to be obstructed by any agency, not to be caused to deviate by prayer or propitiatory exoteric ceremonies. So it's important to recognize how karma works. And we have this, um, this idea, particularly in the West, about, uh, about cause and effect and about God and how, how God can completely nullify cause and effect. And, it, 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 and, and even if we, we have uh, 
we've done all these sorts of terrible things, and we, we won't have to pay for any of them because, well, well, God can completely wash our sins away. But some of the viewers says in Tarot and Kabbalah and, and the, the Mahatma letters um, also say, uh, have a similar message. Someone else says, the father who is in secret signifies the divine monad that is immortal and omniscient. That means he can perceive everything. But without the realization of the self, the monad cannot dominate the physical. He does not have sovereignty over the elements. It is quite incredible that we, who are miserable slugs, have to make our father powerful. It seems a blasphemy, but he has to realize himself. And so, it's important to recognize that God has a great deal of power over our lives. That he can organize our karma in the way that he sees fit. But the karma is what the karma is. It can't just be erased. And so it's important, it's important to have cognizance of this because we need to take responsibility for our actions. We have to be prepared to say, this, this circumstance that I'm experiencing is my fault. And stop pointing the finger at other people and be willing to look into ourselves and to really change. The other thing, the, the other aspect of, of, of this uh, requirement that I want, I want to, to highlight is, is the, the phrase unswerving faith. So this is something that needs to be consistent within us. Doubt is an obstacle for our work. If we vacillate, then in our times of weakness, the ego can say, well, this karma might not be too bad, or karma's not real, just do it, or any other, under, other ridiculous lies that the ego can come up with, and we end up falling into its trap. And so Samuel and Vior gave a remedy for doubt in a piece called Inside the Vestibule of Wisdom. He said, when doubts assault your mind, go and read my books. When you feel the anxious throb of spiritual longing, go and read my writings. When the pseudo-spiritualists insult you and hurt you, remember, companion of mine, that these books, as your loyal and sincere friends, will always be willing to console your painful heart. He is talking about the importance of saturating the mind with impressions that are beneficial for spiritual work. A lot of people lose their way in spiritual work because they don't have a good understanding of how the mind works. Many people think that their minds are like a rock. We tend to buy into this illusion that we have complete and, co and total control of what we think. But similar to what we were talking about a few minutes ago with the newspapers, it's important to recognize how much of what we think and what we feel are based on the impressions that we receive from the outside world. And because we fail to transform those impressions correctly, they go into our subconsciousness and start to shape our minds. I've seen many people lose their faith and motivation in the path because they allow themselves to be in an environment where they were saturated with negative impressions that forced a doubt and materialism. And they were asleep, so those impressions went into their minds without them being fully aware of how these ideas were affecting them. And then, gradually, they started to step away from the work. Now, especially for those of us who are beginners, and most of us are beginners, including myself, we need to be cognizant of how impressionable our minds are. Our minds are like the sands that Jesus spoke of in the gospel. The man built his house upon the sand, and then the rains came, and the winds blow, and the sands fell away, and the house collapsed. The ideal response to this dilemma would be to awaken and to begin perfectly transforming impressions. However, as a practical matter, that is not something we can typically learn how to do overnight. So in the meantime, it's important for us to learn how to intelligently manage the impressions that we receive from the outside world to ensure that the impressions that we are taking in are not going to put our spiritual work in jeopardy. Coming to a Gnostic school is one of the ways that we can do that. So is going on retreat. Being around other people who are supportive of, the, of this work can help us to shore up our own minds, and we can do the same for them. And this is why the Sangha, the spiritual community, is one of the three jewels in Buddhism and is considered so important for those walking the path. 
you, we mutually support each other and help each other to combat doubt. And going out into the world where everyone says only the physical is real, or you're wasting your life with gnosis, even if we know in our hearts that these people are wrong, being bombarded by these impressions day in and day out can start to make us question whether our hearts are leading us right after all. So don't fall into the illusion that your mind or your concepts or your beliefs are the rock of the Bible. We should recognize our own weaknesses and work to deal with the consequences of it. And that means managing our impressions, reading scriptures, spending time with a sangha if we have one, praying and engaging in practices that will fortify our faith and our ability to transform impressions. Number five. A courage undaunted in every emergency, even by peril to life. Why is this important? Well, I want to point out something that Samuel Lombiore says in The Great Rebellion and in, and in other places throughout his works. He says, it is not possible to increase consciousness by exclusively physical or mechanical procedures. Undoubtedly, the consciousness can only awaken through conscious work and voluntary suffering. So suffering is necessary in order to walk this path. Now this does not mean that we should be cold to the suffering of others nor that we should seek out suffering for ourselves or, or for others. Rather, we should utilize the suffering that we have and not try to shy away from it. Now, does this mean that if we have headaches or if we are sitting in a painful position that we can't take an Advil and we have to just tough it out and suffer? Not necessarily. The amount of cognizance that we develop is not necessarily directly tied to the quantity of the pain that we have. Remember, that Samuel and Vior talked about four paths to liberation. And one of those paths is called the path of the failure. Now, this is a completely valid way of entering the absolute, and many choose to use it. And it involves using a whole lot of pain to develop a very, very small amount of kindness. Now, there are other paths that involve less pain and more cognizance. So pain itself does not directly equate into consciousness. And if pain itself was all that it took to awaken, then it would be easy, because then all those people physically mortifying themselves would become Buddhists. But that doesn't happen. There is some benefit to learning how to transform the impressions of physical pain. But that benefit is limited. Rather, what is important is how we approach the pain that we have and how, we, and how deeply we look into our experience of it. And this is not just physical pain. The pain that I'm talking about here is primarily mental and emotional pain. The pain that burns our minds and our hearts. So do we protest our suffering? Do we curse God and our circumstances and our neighbor and the path? Or do we, like the prophet Job, say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Do we look into our pain and say, why do I suffer? What have I done to cause this pain? And do we have the courage to accept the answer? Khalil Gibran talked a bit about the right attitude towards pain in his book, The Prophet. And I wanted to share part of it with you. And a woman spoke saying, tell us a pain. And he said, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Even as the stone of the fruit must break, that its heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life, your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. And you would accept the seasons of your heart, even as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. 
and you would watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. Much of your pain is self-chosen. It is the bitter potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. Therefore, trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. For his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. And the cup he brings, though it burns your lips, has been fashioned of the clay which the potter has moistened with his own sacred tears. So this courage that it talks about in the requirement is a courage to face the reality of who we are. A courage to break free of the conditioning imposed upon us by our parents and our schooling and our friends and our society. And our courage to trust the inner urgings of the spirit and to recognize them when they appear, even when the world and even our own minds are telling us otherwise. Which brings us to our next point. Number six, an intuitional perception of one's being the vehicle of the manifested Avalokiteshvara. That's the cosmic Christ, or the divine Atman, the spirit. Now, observe that this is a perception. It's not a concept. It's not saying, oh, I believe that, that, that I, am, I am a vehicle of, of the cosmic Christ. This is about feeling God within you. Remember that this is a work about your inner God. It's not about you, the personality. And so, because this is a work about our God, we should have a relationship with our inner God and be able to perceive his directives. Now, many of us may not be able to feel God within us. Or the connection is kind of spotty. Now, this is normal because we are so badly separated from him. This is why we have religion at all. Religion comes from the word religare, which means to relink or reconnect. And the reason we need to relink is because the, the link is not there now. So in helping to satisfy this requirement, one of the recommendations I would give you is to pray. Pray with your heart. Not necessarily with words. I remember one time, many years ago, I was an atheist for half an hour. And I spent that whole half hour in prayer with tears in my eyes. And then after all that prayer and all those tears, God soothed my troubled heart. And I was never an atheist again. So reach out to God in your life. I'm recalling a passage from the Hadiths, and I think it goes something like this. When I approached Allah by a finger's length, he approached me by a hand's length. And when I approached Allah by a hand's length, he approached me by an arm's length. And when I came to Allah walking, he came to me running. So approach God in whatever way you have found to be helpful to you. And cultivate that relationship and treasure it. And don't do things that would jeopardize or destroy it. Remember Adam in the Garden of, e in the Garden of Eden when he ate the fruit, when he fornicated. That was the first time he felt fear because God had departed from him as a result of that action. So we should strive to recognize what actions weaken our relationship with our inner God in our own lives and to limit or cut off those behaviors in order to preserve the already fragile connection we have with our God. Number seven, calm indifference for, but a just appreciation of everything that constitutes the objective and transitory world in its relation with and to the invisible regions. So this is a balancing of the mind with respect to the spiritual versus the physical. Now, some of your talks uh, a bit about this balance. He says, many enter the path and thereafter they no longer want to continue working in order to fulfill the needs of every good citizen. Those wretched beings neglect their duties towards their family, the world, and even their own selves. We have heard them say phrases like, money is vain. This is the world of Maya, illusion. I'm no longer interested in the things of the world, etc. This is how these wretched disciples fail because they do not know how to fulfill their duties. 
This is how these devotees of the path move away from initiation, precisely because they do not know how to fulfill their duties as simple citizens. Our disciples will now comprehend why we stated that crime is also hidden within the incense of prayer. The one who enters the path must first of all be a model spouse, a model father or mother, a model child, a model citizen, a magnificent grandson or granddaughter, and a patriarchal grandfather or grandmother, etc. The one who does not know how to fulfill his duties as a simple citizen cannot tread the path of the great mysteries. Many disciples forget the good manners of, of a sincere and honorable lady or gentleman and become truly irresponsible and even dangerous individuals. So as St. Paul says, we have to learn how to live in the world, but not of it. It's important to recognize that the world as we perceive it is illusory in nature, but that doesn't mean that we can forsake it entirely. We need a calm indifference for it, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, to those who have conquered themselves a clod of dirt, a stone, and gold are all the same. They are equally disposed to family, enemies, and friends, to those who support them and those who are hostile, to the good and the evil alike. Because they are impartial, they rise to great heights. But this indifference is not a coldness to the suffering of the world nor is it a rejection of our responsibilities or, or our relationships. We need a just appreciation of everything that constitutes this world. What we do not need is identification with the world. So those were the seven requirements of students who sought access to the teachings. I know when I first saw these, I was discouraged because I am lacking in many of these traits myself. What we don't want is to say, oh well, I'm sunk. I guess I'll give up. So I wanted to leave you today with a few words of encouragement. This is from Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. He said, You have heard the intellectual explanation of Sankhya, Arjuna. Now listen to the principles of yoga. By practicing these, you can break through the bonds of karma. On this path, effort never goes to waste. And there is no failure. Even a little effort towards spiritual awareness will protect you from the greatest terrors. So no matter where you are in this work, whether you've already cultivated all of their characteristics to their perfection, or if you have none, have faith that any work that you do along this path will be beneficial. Maybe we won't become masters or Buddhas in this lifetime. But perhaps we can pay off a little bit of our karma. Perhaps we can give our soul just a little bit more wisdom. And perhaps we can do something to soothe the suffering of others and make this world just a little less painful. So keep at it and keep working. Thank you very much. Uh, you stated that about karma. Karma. Yeah. Which I understand your concept, but <clears throat> yeah. in religion there is this uh, saying. Mm -hmm. You say, uh, Lamb of God that erases the sins of the world, appear now. Yes. of the law is part of the scale. Yes, yes, that's correct. And when an inferior law is transcended by a superior law, the superior law washes away the inferior. Actually, I was, I was going, I was going to, to use that quote by some of you are too in my, in, in, in my response, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you used it. Um, karma is a conscious law. And some of you are explains, um, and this coincides with everything taught in religions, that karma is, is negotiable. And so, just because we have generated the causes of a, particular, um, of a particular effect, that doesn't mean that necessarily that specific effect has to be, um, has to be fulfilled. So when we say the line of the law can be fought with a uh, scale, 
we're talking about how we can use good deeds to cancel out the effects of, of evil deeds. Because, the, um, like, like you said, a superior law washes away the inferior law. So the, 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 conscious, the, the, the conscious lords of karma or conscious negotiation of that karma can, can cancel out the karma that we have. So this is not um, that the karma gets, gets obliterated, but it is, being, it is being balanced out by, by other karmas. By, by, other, by other good deeds, yes. Um, and with regards to the, uh, to, to the Lamb of God, this is, um, I believe this is a teaching about, about the Christ in, in the, uh, the, the, the higher levels of initiation where the Christ can, can come into you and help you to pay your karma and, and forgive your sins, if you will, to help you, help you negotiate this and work with you so that the, you don't necessarily have to pay with pain for all of the uh, all of the bad deeds that we have committed, because we've we've been accumulating bad deeds for for eons and eons and eons, and if we had to, to pay pay with pain for all of that, it, w it would it would be too much. Um, there is there is a path where you can do that, whether we talked about earlier, called the path of the failure, um, or you can just pay pay everything with pain, but. If you want to take the, take the path uh, uh, that, that leads to the incarnation of the Christ, the direct path, um, he can help you negotiate that karma and, and to, to wash it away. That make, that make sense? Yeah, that makes yeah. Thank you. It's not like uh, the other people that think that they're believing in the Christ. Yeah. There's no way that karma is going to be erased. No. <laughs> it, 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 the Christ has to enter into you, and that's why it is... Um, the, uh, many of the Christian mystics, they said it's 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 uh, it's not enough for to to just look at the at the cross on Golgotha. He has to he has to be crucified in your heart. Yes. The path of the failure. Are you referring to somebody who goes through two thousand cycles? Three thousand cycles. Yeah, it's the the snail shell of existence. Yeah, that's that's the path of the failure. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they develop complete self-cognizance and they enter the absolute with self-cognizance. With self so that's better than what they started with. Um, but the, uh, they don't develop the cognizance of a master. And they have to pay with a lot more pain to develop uh, uh, even less cognizance. So, but that's, uh, many people choose that path and, and that's their decision. But um, it, don't let them influence you in your choice of a path. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.